we will cover the important concepts from chapter 12 and chapter 13. Be sure for each chapter that you are able to explain the objectives and that will ensure that you have a good understanding of the content that is in the chapter. Chapter 12 is about the communicable and infectious disease risks. So in this chapter, they have selected specific disease processes that we will talk about. So STDs are either STIs, sexually transmitted diseases or sexually transmitted infections. They're kind of, they're used interchangeably. Remember, we do have Healthy People 2030 Goals and Objectives. And the ones for that are relevant to this chapter are reduce infections of the HPV types prevented by the vaccine in young adults, reduce the rate of mother to child HIV transmission, and increase the proportion of adolescents who get the recommended dose of the HPV vaccine. If you recall, they are doing a huge push of the different, um, you know, since the HPV vaccine has been on um, the market, they have been doing a huge push to health departments. You see all the different commercials. And so the, all this just increasing the education so that people are more knowledgeable and can make an informed decision about if they want to get the vaccine or not. And we'll talk more about that as we discuss the chapter. So human immunodeficiency virus infection, also named, known as HIV, it is a virus that attacks the body's immune system. If treated, if not treated, it can lead to full-blown acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, which is also called AIDS. There is no cure for HIV, but it can be uh, maintained with proper medical care and the disease can be controlled. So there are advances in um, medical, different kind of medications. And so, and you've been, I don't know if you all have noticed, but there are several commercials about the new medications that the patients that need, um, that have um, the chronic disease of HIV. And so in the past, the persons that were infected, they would have to take numerous appeals daily. So now in the commercials, if you pay attention, they're saying, hey, you know, one a day or one a week uh, treatment. So there have been great advances with the treatment and the maintenance of, you know, someone that has this disease process. The natural history of HIV includes three stages, the primary infection within a month of contracting the virus, followed by a period when there are no symptoms, and then a final stage of where the, um, the disease is symptomatic. When HIV enters the body, it can cause a mononucleosis-like syndrome, referred to as the primary infection, which can last a few weeks. You know, it may go unrecognized, but initially the body CD4, the white blood cell count drops for a brief time when the virus is most plentiful in the body. The immune system increases the antibody production in response to this initial infection, which is that's how the immune system works, but it's, which is self-limiting illness. Some people have flu-like symptoms within two to four weeks after the infection, and these symptoms may last for a few days for several weeks. You know, they may have night sweats, muscle aches. They may just think that they have the flu. Um, an antibody test at this stage is usually negative, so it's often not recognized as HIV. And then, so about after six to six weeks to three months, the HIV antibodies begin to appear in the blood. AIDS is the third stage, it's the late stage on the long continuum of HIV. And it's the, it's the most considered, it's the most severe stage. Potential blood and tissue donors are interviewed to screen for a history of any high risk activities. Remember, uh, an activity is considered to be high risk if the, it puts a person at risk for coming in contact with blood and body fluids. So that could be drug use, IV drug use. It could be unprotected sex. 
anything that would put the person at risk for coming in contact with blood and body fluids. Nurses must identify the trend of HIV infection in the populations that they serve. So the HIV antibody test is most commonly used, the, the most commonly used screening test. This test does just as it names implies. It does not reveal whether an individual has symptomatic AIDS, nor does it isolate the virus. It does indicate the presence of those antibodies, those HIV antibodies being there inside of the bloodstream. The most commonly um, used form of this test is the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. And then they do the Western blot to minimize false, um, false results. The bacterial infections include, when we're talking about um, other sexually transmitted diseases, the bacterial infections include gonorrhea, syphilis, chlamydia. Most of these infections are cured with antibiotics, with the exception of the new emerging antibiotic resistant strands of gonorrhea. Yes, now we do have more disease processes that are becoming resistant to the antibiotics that we currently have. But remember, ST, STDs caused by viruses cannot be cured. The viral infections include the HSV and the HPV, also referred to as genital warts. This table gives you another way of looking at those different disease processes, but we'll talk through each one of them. For gonorrhea, it is a gram-negative intracellular diplococcal bacterium that affects the mucous membranes of the, G, the GU, the genourinary tract, the rectum, and the pharynx. Gonorrhea can be transmitted by having vaginal, anal, or oral sex with a person who has the disease. Gonorrhea is identified as either uncomplicated or complicated. Uncomplicated gonorrhea refers to limited cervical or urethral infections. The complicated gonorrhea includes systematic gonococcal infections or meningitis. The signs and symptoms of the infection in males are purulent and copious amount of urethral drainage or discharge and painful um, urination. <clears throat> Symptoms in males are typically significant enough for the person to go and get treatment. For gonorrhea, unlike some of the other disease processes we'll talk about, it it is simply the you the person does have symptoms. Some of the other STDs or STIs don't the person doesn't present with any symptoms. But gonorrhea, that person is going to have those um, signs and symptoms as an increasing result. And as an increasing, um, we're finding out incidence of drug resistance. Treatment of gonorrhea is becoming more complex. Um, <clears throat> in 2005, there were five treatments for gonorrhea, and at this time, there is only one treatment. That's that rocephin. Syphilis is caused by a member <clears throat> of the tropical group of spirochetes. It infects most mucous or cutaneous membranes and is spread through direct contact, usually by sexual contact or from the mother to the fetus. Transmission via blood transfusion may occur if the donor is in its early stages of the disease. So we have primary syphilis, secondary, and tertiary, and then congenital. Congenital syphilis, syphilis is transmitted through the placenta, transplacental, and the preferred treatment is the penicillin. So for primary, that's when syphilis is actually acquired sexually. The bacteria produce infection in the form of a cankerer at the site of entry. And the lesion begins as a macula and it, it progresses and become a papule. 
Secondary syphilis occurs when the organism enters the lymph system and spreads throughout the body. So, you know, we have that lymph system up throughout our body. Tertiary syphilis can lead to blindness, congenital damage, heart damage, and even uh, some mental issues. You might, person might end up having um, psychosis. And again, as we mentioned, the preferred treatment is penicillin. So for so chlamydia, chlamydia infection caused by the bacterium chlamydia trachomastasis. It infects the GU, um, the gyro, the genourinary cyst tract, and the rectum of the adults and causes conjunctivitis and pneumonia in neonates. Transmission occurs when mucopurulent discharge from infected sites such as the cervix comes in contact with mucous membranes. So just like if it, that contact is made, then the person is at risk for um, contracting chlamydia. Because the cervix of a teenage girl and young woman are not fully developed, it puts them at a higher risk, in a high risk group for contracting this disease process. So symptoms in women include dysuria, the urinary frequency, and the purulent vaginal discharge. If the, if the infection spreads, <clears throat> the person may have some lower back pain, some fever, it may have in between some breakthrough bleeding in between their normal menstrual um, cycles. And it can cause PID, it can cause um, atopic pregnancies, infertility. The CDC do, they do recommend annual chlamydial screenings for all sexually active women younger than age 25 and women over 25 who are in increased risk for infection. That's so that's someone that's having uh, multiple sexual partners. For um, herpes simplex virus 2, there are two types of herpes caused by HSV. The first is oral. And it's usually, people usually refer to those as cold sores or fever blisters. And they usually are on the face, around the mouth. There is no cure for herpes infection, and it is considered a chronic disease. The virus is, again, this is another one that is transmitted through the exposure, that contact um, of the genitalia and the surrounding um, skin. The HSV-2 infection is linked with the development of cervical cancer. There is also an increased risk of fatal, of fatal newborn infections during vaginal delivery if there are active lesions. So a pregnant woman that has active lesions, they may decide to do a C-section or cesarean section just to protect the health of the un unborn child. The human papillomona virus or HPV results in genital wards. You do have two specific types. The CDC has recommended a two dose schedule for people who get the first dose before their 15th birthday. And then there may be a third dose that's recommended for those that are over the age of 15, just so they have that extra layer of protection. Once the HPV infection, infection occurs, the goal of therapy is to eliminate the warts. Genital warts spontaneously disappear over time. However, because the, the condition is worse than the client and the HPV may lead to development of cervical neoplasia, that cancer. Hepatitis. Viral hepatitis refers to a group of infections that primarily affect the liver. So we'll talk about the different types of hepatitis. Hepatitis A is a virus. It is a vaccine preventable disease of the liver that's caused by the HIV, the hepatitis A virus. It is usually transmitted from person to person through the fecal oral route or through contaminated food or water. In countries with improved sanitation, outbreaks are common in daycare centers whose staff must change diapers among household and sexual contacts 
of the infected <clears throat> individuals and among travelers to countries where hepatitis A is on the rise or is considered an endemic. So there's a large number of people that already have the hepatitis A. Some of the signs and symptoms may include clay colored stools, dark urine, fever, fatigue, nausea, and vomiting. So the hepatitis B, HBV is also a vaccine preventable liver disease that is transmitted when blood, semen, or another body fluid from a person infected with the virus enters the person that's not infected. <clears throat> the, the virus can survive for at least one week dried at room temperature on an environmental surface. Therefore, the infection control measures are paramount in preventing transmission from client to client, wiping down those surfaces, keeping things nice and clean, washing your hands, putting on those protective, those PPE, personal protective equipment, when you're actually cleaning up and wiping up surfaces. The OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, mandates specific activities to protect workers from HPV and other bloodborne pathogens. Potential exposures for healthcare workers are needle stick injuries and mucous membrane splashes. So if you are doing a procedure or something that says, hey, you know, that you need to wear your goggles, you need to take the time to place those things on. Now, many facilities now are using the, the syringes that have a safety mechanism, mechanism on them. Make sure that you know how to use that safety mechanism because if you if you don't know how to use it, you can you run the risk of injuring and sticking yourself, having a needle stick. So OSHA's standard requires employers to identify the risk for blood exposure to various employees. If employees perform work that involves potential exposure to the body fluids of other people, employees are mandated to offer the HBV vaccine to the employee at the employer's expense and offer annual educational programs on preventing HBV and HIV exposures in the workplace. So hepatitis C virus is another liver disease and is caused by the hepatitis C virus, which is a blood-borne virus. It is transmitted when blood and body fluids of an infected person enter an uninfected person. Today, most people are infected with hepatitis C by sharing needles or other equipment to in inject drugs. So primary preventive measures include screening of blood products and donor organs and tissues, risk reduction counseling, including obtaining injection drug use. Secondary prevention strategies include testing of high-risk individuals, including those who currently inject drugs or, <clears throat> or injected drugs in the past, those that have the HIV infection. So you would do, the um, doctor might see abnormal liver results, liver um, test results. So anyone, I know they have done extra screening for those that have received organ transplants before 1992 because they were not testing for this in those organs. So anyone that has received an organ transplant before 1992 or those that are on hemodialysis, um, you know, they do the extra screening for those. Tuberculosis is a mycobacterial disease, which is caused by the mycobacterium tuberculosis. Transmission usually occurs through the exposure is airborne, exposure of a tuberculin bacilli from a person that actually has active TB. So that person is walking, sneezing, well, if they're talking, coughing, or sneezing, and you just happen to walk by, and that was bacterium was actually on that 
airdrop it, then you could get infected. TB disease is a lung, in the lungs can cause symptoms such as cough that lasts three weeks or more, pain in the chest, person's coughing up blood, they might even have night sweats. The incubation, the incubation period is four to 12 weeks. To prevent TB, the CDC works with the public health agencies in other countries to improve screening and reporting of those cases. So the, the most effective is the tuberculin skin test or the TST. It's also called the Mantus test. It is used for the initial screening. It can be followed by a chest x-ray in the event that they get a positive or, or reactive result. And so you would actually have to measure the, um, the reaction. A blood test is also available. Diagnosis can also be made through a stained sputum um, smear. So those are the different ways that we can test for tuberculosis. Clients with tuberculosis or TB should be treated promptly with the appropriate combination of multiple antimicrobial drugs. Usually the medical regime for people that have tuberculosis is a long, they're long term. So a person might have to take medications from six months all the way out to a year. From prevention to treatment, the nurse functions as a counselor. As an educator, it's just the ongoing role as an advocate, a case manager, and primary care provider. Primary prevention aims to keep people healthy and avoid the onset of the disease. So keep that in mind when we're talking about primary prevention. So you want to assess first for risk behavior and provide relevant intervention through education on how to avoid infection. So the, the focus is to keep people healthy and to avoid the, the disease process altogether. So this chart does give us some different types of primary interventions, secondary um, prevention, and tertiary. We might want to provide a community education about prevention of communicable diseases to a well population. If we're going to, to administer those TB skin tests, that will be considered a secondary preventative measure. And then tertiary, the person already has the disease process and that per you're trying to help that person maintain so, they can, so that they can live that best quality of life. Interventions um, is education on how to prevent the infection or the availability of things such as vaccines. Safe for sex, sexual abstinence is the best way to prevent sexually transmitted diseases. Clients should understand that it's important to know the risk behavior of their sexual partners, including their history of injection drug use. So drug use, individuals should be advised against using injectable drugs and sharing needles and syringes. Effective outreach programs include community peers, increasing the accessibility of drug treatment programs, and long-term repeat contacts after the person has completed the programs. So you as a nurse might work to help establish a program. So secondary prevention includes screening for diseases to ensure their early identification, early detection, and so that treatment can be put into place. Testing um, enables clients to benefit from early detection and treatment as well as risk reduction education. These are just some of the different intervention. Tertiary prevention focuses on managing symptoms and maintaining psychosocial support. Many clients report feeling contaminated and thus feel lower self-worth. Support groups may help in directly observe therapy for TB medication. Nurses observe and document individual clients taking their medications, those tuber tuberculosis um, drugs. 
when clients prematurely stop taking the medications for TB, they're at risk for th that resistance setting up. So it is important to teach caregivers about infection control in the home, washing the hands, wearing your mask, maintaining that six feet. Standard precautions must be taught to caregivers in the home setting. All blood and articles soiled with blood and body fluids must be handled as though they were infectious. So the person needs to wear goggles, um, mask, gown, and gloves. They, they need to do so. So it provides that extra layer of protection. So this chapter emphasizes the epidemiology and prevention of selected communicable diseases, as well as the public health nursing services provided to the clients. So important points to remember, it is important for the nurse to educate clients about ways to prevent communicable diseases, washing your hands, um, abstinence. Many sexually transmitted diseases, a person is asymptomatic. They do not have any symptoms. They have no idea that something's really there. They have been infected with a disease, with a bacteria or a virus. Aside from death, the most serious complications caused by STDs or we talked about that, ectopic pregnancy, infertility, pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID. Hepatitis A is often silent in children, and children are a significant source of infection to others. The use of the vaccine in children has led to the, a reduction in the hepatitis A um, occurrences. Hepatitis C is the most common blood-borne pathogen in the United States. And we talked about how medications, um, disease practices are becoming resistant to the, the, the medication, either because the person, you know, started taking the medications, they started and they stopped, and or there's a different um, derivative of that bacteria. So some important concepts from chapter 13, which um, deals with community assessment and evaluation. Community health, as used in this chapter, is defined as the meeting of the collective needs through identification of the problem and management of behaviors within the community itself and between the community and a larger society. So you're taking into account of not just that person, but the community that they live in, whether that be the home, the work environment. How do you collect that information? Five methods of collecting data useful to the nurse are analysis of existing secondary data, conducting those windshield surveys, and we'll talk about that in a moment, and the primary data collection. Nurses should identify and partner with gatekeepers. These are formal, informal community members so that you can gain acceptance in the community. You know, if that person's the gatekeeper and they say no, if they're that that person that people trust in, and if they say don't participate or don't, you know, give all the information to the public health nurse, then they might not because that person, um, they have confidence in that person and they know that person won't steer them wrong. So nurses should identify and partner with those gatekeepers. Those are key people in the community that have a heavy, a large influence on acceptance. The planning phase includes analyzing and establishing priorities among community health problems that have been already identified. Once high problems are identified, a broad, broad relevant goals and objectives are developed. The goal is generally a broad statement of the desired outcome. Intervention activities the means by which an objectives are met are the strategies is the things that they do. And then implementation, the next phase of the nursing process means transforming a plan for improved community health into achieving goals and objectives. Simply defined, evaluation is the appraisal of the effects. Was the goal met? Was it not met? Was it partially met? Communities are the environments where we live and where we work. 
Naturally, the community's ability to serve the needs of its members determines key aspects of the health of the community. The public health nurse is an ideal position to view the community as a client and to begin to identify the harness and harness the strengths and, pre and present to meet the needs and challenges that are faced by the community. So a community is defined as a group of people in a defined population who share something in common, such as geographic location or interests or values. Understanding the many identi identities of a community is part of a community assessment and is best done through talking with and collecting data from the residents, the persons that live there, and also the stakeholders, people that will benefit and when we say benefit, we're not always talking about money, but benefit from that population being healthy or not. They, you know, on the other side is if the population isn't healthy, the stakeholders do not benefit. The community is a client when the nursing focus is on the collective of common good of the population instead of focusing only on one one individual person's health but the good of the population everybody let's get everybody well population centered practice seeks healthful change for the whole community benefit nurses caring for the community as the client identify effects that these complex community parts have in the individual's health they work with all parts of the community to achieve a goal of healthy community The Newman's model, nursing care for the community as a client, identify effects that these complex community parts have on individuals' health. They work with all parts of the community to achieve the goal of a healthy community. Newman model views systems as a great, view system as greater than the sum of their parts. So it doesn't just look at one part but greater than the sum of all the parts. Partnering with community members is going to be key so that you are able to assess the, the community, so that you uh, that trust is has been established, so that you'll get all the information that you need so that you can determine what is the real problem and what are real solutions. We talked about those gatekeepers. And then um, we have CHWs, those are community health workers. They're not professional or licensed healthcare providers, but they're community members from a diverse background who receive training to do health outreach work. Focus group. It's similar to an interview where you have a group of people and you just get them together and they talk about whatever the issue is. So they give you their thoughts. They give you, um, you know, the things that people have shared with them, not necessarily breaking um, confidentiality, but just the ideas and the concepts. So a focus group is similar to an interview in that it collects data mainly through asking open-ended questions, those open-ended questions so that you get more information to a small group rather than to one individual. So you'll get together maybe three or five persons and then pose a question or idea and see what the information, see what they think about it. So photo voice is a community assessment technique in which the community members, they take pictures that represent whatever that topic is. This is a good um, example of how to use photo voice in the community assessment. The health impact assessment is a process to predict the effects of on health, the map mobilizing for action through planning and partnerships is a strategic planning process to select high priority public health issues and to match them with the resources. 
The CHANGE, or Community Health Assessment and Group Evaluation, is a tool to help communities annually to gather and organize data about the community health plan to, so they can plan programs and then monitor the changes over time. Community health needs assessment is a set of guidelines for nonprofits, hospitals to assess the communities that they actually serve. The windshield surveys are a method of simple observation. They provide a quick overview of the community and can be used along with photographs and interviews to get a general idea of the community. This um, table here, table 13.3, gives you an example of the guidelines for the windshield survey. The Omaha system and the North American Nursing Diagnosis Association, which you all know as NANDA, are two prominent systems of classification. So that they have a list of those nursing diagnoses. So just remember community health was used in this chapter is defined as the meeting of the collective needs to identifying the problems and management of those behaviors. And then you would need to go through those five methods of collecting data that's useful to the nurse and the analysis of the existing secondary data. Please feel free to reach out regarding questions and concerns. Be sure to do your attestation for this week. 